William of our semester here. Uh, I want to start by announcing that our speaker next week will be David Zavala uh, from Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today uh, John Willinghoff. Uh, John is the former chairman of FERC, Federal Electric Regulatory Commission, uh, appointed by uh, then President Obama. Uh, he was a leader in that position in integrating renewable energy and energy efficiency into the electric grid and changing the rules nationally to, to uh, speed that process. Uh, prior to that, he was uh, with the Public Service uh, Utilities Commission of Nevada where he was general counsel and at one time the first consumer advocate. Uh, but lately, since uh, leaving the federal government, uh, he has uh, been stolen away by Elon Musk and is the head of uh, chief policy officer over regulatory affairs for Solar City, which is now being integrated fully into Tesla. Uh, it's fair to say that John is one of the most influential voices in the country today on energy policy. And uh, will tell us some about where our energy future is going. John? Thank you, Roger. So hopefully, is this, this lapel mic working? Everybody hear me? Okay, good. Let me take the coat off here, get, get into my lecture mode, into a discussion. What I am going to, and absolutely going to try to keep uh, some time uh, at the end, about 15, 20 minutes, so we can have discussion and some questions. But today, um, I'm going to talk about um, not solely Texas's restructured market, although I think you've done a great job with it here, uh, but talking beyond that, and beyond that not only for Texas, but for the f whole country. So can this guy actually kick an 80-yard 80, 80, uh, field goal, is my understanding? He can. I've, al I've also been told uh, not to say T-U. I'm supposed to say U-T. And, I, it, it, and that's very hard for me because... <clears throat> My history with Texas many years ago was when I came here and testified in Austin on behalf of consumers against TU. And TU at that time was Texas Utilities. So, so I have that in my brain, but I'll try to keep it a, as, as, uh, as UT. So <clears throat> in talking about um, restructuring and in talking about changing electric markets in this country and changing even what Texas has done to something that is even more efficient and you have a very efficient and competitive market here that I, I envy and wish I could replicate in most of the other states around the country, we got to talk about some very big picture things. And uh, one of the big picture things with respect to any regulatory change is uh, this question, uh, and I, I can ask this question because I am an attorney, and so I think it, it is important to know, you know, when do you have too many lawyers? Well. You, ha you know you have too many lawyers if you have a company that runs a meeting, uh, you know, or a conference, and uh, they do this. You know, they put out the nuts, and then they have a sign that says, mixed nuts contains nuts. Because this, was, this, this is actually a, a real sign, a real sign that I actually saw at a real conference that I looked at it and I said, what is this? And they said, oh yeah, the lawyers make us do that. So you know that you've got too many lawyers when you've got people making you do really crazy things like this. And, and, and these kinds of things actually, the point of this is, these kinds of things can really get in the way of us making effective regulations and effective changes. And I would contend, uh, although I'm going to be ending with a slide on technology, but I would contend that from a technological standpoint, we have a lot of what we need in place, although Roger and I, I think, agree that some, because of some of the complexities, we may need more computing power and more other uh, uh, data technology to help us manage some of this stuff. But from the standpoint of technology, technology I don't see as the biggest problem. I really see policy as the biggest part of the problem. Although from the technology side, I mean, you know, there is an issue of determining you know, when you've got too many engineers, and I know that many of you are engineers or aspire uh, to be such, well, you have too many engineers when you build a substation that looks like this. I mean, ultimately, when you have an electric substation, and many electric substations in the United States are like this, you know, ex exceedingly overly redundant and, 
and you know, not any concern for aesthetics or anything else, or or re really even functionality, but uh, concern for uh, you know what was initially reliability, keep the lights on kind of thing. But you know, let's just get the thing up and and put 12 of them there so we make sure that it, that it continues to work. Uh, oh, there's Elon Musk. He's in his Tesla driving by. Um, we're going to talk about Elon uh, later in a second, but let's have Elon come back for a second um, and talk about something else with respect to technology and the technology that's available. Uh, there is probably at least a thousand times more computing power in that car than there is in that entire substation. And, you know, this is historical fact of utilities just being extremely conservative, number one. Number two, uh, having to justify every penny that they spend, although they do want to spend money because that's how they make money. But ultimately, you know, upgrading our system to more modern, modern systems has been uh, a struggle. And, and Roger and I have talked a lot about the smart grid, and, and sometimes we think the smart grid is going too far, and it may not be something that uh, is ultimately going to give us what we want, better, greater reliability at lower costs, and, and greater functionality, and greater competitiveness and options and choices on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, we've got to move away from the type of substations uh, that we see behind us, and we've got to have things that are much more digitally controlled and much more visible, not only to the grid operator down, you know, next door uh, at the local uh, town level, but visible to your grid operator like ERCOT at the central um, uh, wholesale grid level. Both of those grid operators have to have visibility into what's happening here and happening beyond that with respect to lots of resources that I'll talk about in a minute. So in addition to engineers and lawyers that we have to worry about, the other thing we have to worry about in changing the structure of systems is what is your opportunity cost? Opportunity cost is ultimately, you know, what is the cost to you to do something versus how much benefit are you getting out of doing something? And it's something we have to think about. Many people <coughs> in this country, uh, you know, pay much, much more in their cell phone bill than they do in their electric bill. Uh, you know, they don't even think about paying, you know, a $300 cell phone bill, but if they got, you know, a $150 electric bill, they'd, they'd go crazy. Um, and so, again, you have to think about how much savings are available to people how much they really can save, or are there values that you can give people, higher levels of reliability and service of some kind with respect to energy, providing energy for additional um, appliances, additional resources like electric vehicles, etc. How do we bring additional services to consumers? And in do, doing that, help them understand the best way to bring that is to, again, restructure markets, make them more competitive, make them more open. So on opportunity cost, let's, let's do a little example here. So you're walking down an escalator and you see, it's down on the ground and you look down and all of a sudden you see something down there. And, and what it turns out to be is this. It's a penny. And the escalator's moving behind you, there's people behind you. Are you going to lean down there and pick up that penny? I guarantee you that you won't. Your opportunity cost is way, way too high of, of injury, of all kinds of things, bad things that could happen to you for the cost of picking up a penny. So let's escalate it a little more. This is a, a shot that I took on the BART, which is our subway in uh, the Bay Area where I live now. I commute every day over to San Francisco from Berkeley. And you can see how crowded it was. This is this lady sitting next to, standing next to me. We're all standing like this. And I took my camera out and I took the shot. And the reason I took the shot was not because I liked her t-shirt or her sweatshirt. It was because I saw something on the floor. And I, and I looked down at the floor. <laughs> and there it was. There was a dollar bill. And I'm thinking, OK. And I look around. I look at everybody. And everybody's looking down. They all see the dollar bill. We're all looking around. Do you think anybody leans down to get that dollar bill? No. Nobody leaned down to get that dollar bill. Nobody. We all got off that BART. And I don't know what happened to the dollar bill. But nobody leaned over to pick up the dollar bill because their opportunity cost was too high of embarrassment, of whatever they thought was going to happen when they got down there, of whatever. But people did not do that. So we've got to think about opportunity cost. We've got to think about uh, what it takes politically and technologically to make restructuring operate and financially. 
what it's going to take. And all those things have to come together, and they have to come together in some you know, very effective way, ultimately. And those are all issues. And we're also seeing uh, you know, transitions in our society, great transitions, from you know, a phone of not too long ago to the iPhone, uh, smartphone of today. We're seeing you know, transitions in technology from the, uh, the DVD. I mean, my son, who's 24, asked me when I show him a D DVD, what's that? You know, they don't, you know, people don't even use DVDs anymore, ultimately. They're all, you know, it's all in the cloud. And um, when you go from, uh, you know, the taxi to the Uber, although I understand the Uber didn't do too well in Austin here, but, uh, you know, people are, are looking at uh, the sharing economy, and they're all also looking at, you know, bricks and mortar to uh, the commerce, the e-commerce economy. So all these things are happening from a financial standpoint and from a, an economic standpoint, giving consumers more choices, giving consumers more options, but we still are, you know, getting our electricity basically the same way, except for you folks who, uh, you know, I do again have to commend Texas because you have, you know, outside of Austin, which is a muni, and there are munis and co-ops, which I think are, are good structural entities to deliver those services. But in the competitive areas, uh, outside of those areas in Texas, you have 15 or 20 providers that you can go to ultimately and provide you, provide you services. So you know, what other additional services can be provided from uh, an electric uh, energy delivery service uh, perspective? So um, with respect to grid policy and, and delivery of energy services, as Roger said, I've been doing this a little while. Been doing this uh, about 40 years. Hate to admit that to folks, but uh, this is one of the uh, articles I've I've written fairly recently, a couple of years ago, on roof parity with respect to solar, and how it relates to uh, the costs of energy that you acquire otherwise, and what what the what the relative costs are. Uh, uh, but I've also written articles beyond that of about distribution systems and about how those distribution systems should be run and should be operated. And I'll talk a little bit about those later as well. But all these things come into play because consumers are starting to make choices. They're starting to make choices behind the meter. Well, I've got a couple slides about that. And by making those choices for solar PV systems or for storage or for simple things like uh, a Nest thermostat, uh, you know, they're ultimately making choices that relate to how they use their energy, uh, but they're also making choices about uh, options they have for using those uh, devices in other ways than simply internally for themselves. So let's talk about energy overall. And this is one of my favorite slides. I like to show this slide to uh, everybody when I do a, uh, a talk. Uh, this is a slide that comes from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs. I think this is a, a 2014 one, but the, and it's generally the, close to the same for 2015 or 2016. What it depicts is it depicts all of the energy that's used in the United States on an annual basis. And it uh, shows this in quads, quadrillion BTUs, and it shows you the input of the source energy, where it comes from, and then it goes through the system to how it's used. And so we start over here with petroleum, and you can see most of the petroleum goes through and it all mostly used in transportation. A lot of it, some of it's used in the industrial side for uh, furnaces and various other things, but most, mo the vast majority of it's used to run cars, buses, tra trains, and, and transportation overall. And we've got biomass, we've got coal, natural gas, geothermal, wind, hydro, nuclear, solar, and you can see that all those resources, the vast amount of them with the exception of natural gas, which is used a lot for heating and hot water and commercial, residential, and industrial processes, all the other ones, and, and also natural gas to some degree, um, are used in electric generation. In fact, I think if you looked at the most recent 2016, you might see natural gas flip over with coal, or actually more of it's used in electric generation than coal. It, it's very close, I think. It's getting closer and closer, and I think, it's, I think it's close now. So the interesting thing is if you look at the left side here, you've got uh, something like 98 quads of energy input that go through these processes and then go out to these end uses, residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation. And at the end, you, you list up all of the energy services that you get out, the lighting, the heating, the moving the cars, the air conditioning, 
the industrial uh, processes, uh, you know, everything you can think of that provides you services, and you get, uh, you know, about 39 quads. And you then also add up all the energy that's wasted that goes through these processes, and you get about 60 quads. So the result is we, s we, we waste almost 60% of our energy, and we waste it all along the chain. We waste it in the production and in the input to generation and generation itself. We, we waste it in the transmission and distribution, and we waste it in the end use in, in heating, lighting, air conditioning, and other uses. All of those things constitute ways that the, the energy that comes from these sources here is ultimately wasted at the end. So what this chart tells me, the overall big picture of the chart, from my perspective is we have a hell of a lot of waste and we, sh we, we can do a lot about it. We can do a lot about it by trying to figure out how the system can be made to work better. Work better so that we can improve efficiencies and I would say we can improve those efficiencies in part through technologies by putting in LED lighting and all kinds of new advanced technologies that are available but also by changing structures. Change the market structures for competition at the wholesale level and at the retail level and by changing those market structures you can allow for the better flow of energy, you can allow for better price signals to consumers so they can better understand when they should consume and when they shouldn't consume and that will help us operate these systems, the generators, much more efficiently, reduce the overall uh, inefficiency and excess consumption that's done because, uh, you know, if you're in essence starting something up and, and shutting it down back and forth to try to meet a load that's moving all the time, you're uh, wasting much more energy than if you have a load that in essence is much flatter that's trying to um, maximize its economic benefits by minimizing moving around all the time. And it can be done. It's not a matter of asking consumers to um, sacrifice, to as Jimmy Carter is, is often uh, framed with, you know, sitting in the dark with your sweater. That's not necessary uh, because of some of the technologies we have. We can, in fact, you know, decide when things should be turned in, on and off. I can, you know, I've got on my iPhone the capability to shut off much, much to the chagrin of my wife and children, I can shut off the, the thermostats at, at home from Austin, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, you do have those capabilities and there are ways to automate those things that can reduce costs overall. And so that's what we hopefully want to do. So the other interesting thing about end-used energy in the electric sector, and we're going to shift over to the electric sector here, is that <clears throat> if you look at the latest prices, this is from Lazard, Lazard, which is a, a, a large financial firm that does these estimates once every year. And this is their latest one of conventional energy at the bottom, uh, like coal and natural gas, nuclear gas peaking, etc. And at the top, uh, what they say is alternative energy, energy efficiency, wind biomass, etc. Uh, but for energy efficiency, which is the cheapest of all, if you look at the generating resources, the cheapest thing to do right now is wind and solar. Wind and solar are cheaper than everything else. They're cheaper than natural gas. They're cheaper than coal. They're cheaper than nuclear. They're cheaper than every single one of those other alternatives on this chart. So again, if we start putting in place effective restructured markets, both wholesale and retail, in ways that consumers can understand and work with those markets effectively and do it in a way that, again, they're not having to watch prices on their iPhone every hour because nobody's going to do that, but uh, automate some of the things that they're going to do and automate it in ways that uh, they can uh, save money by responding to those prices, then ultimately uh, we're going to be buying a lot more solar and wind because those are the cheaper, cheaper things to do, ultimately. I've got a question, yes? Pardon me? Right. These, these include the entire development costs for the system, and these are also the unsubsidized costs. This does not include the PCC, this does not, uh, production tax credit, does not include the, the ITC, the investment tax credit. This is unsubsidized cost, and this is all the costs, full in, levelized uh, cost of energy to develop those, those products. So, and, you know, it's, it's getting even cheaper. Solar is coming down, continues to come down. 
So the other thing is central uh, station plants, which were things that utilities built a lot in this state and now can't own anymore and are still building in other states to some degree, although they're moving away from it because wind and solar is so cheap, you know, it's really an anachronism from many perspectives. This is a plant actually outside of Las Vegas. They're going to close this down. This is the uh, uh, Reed Gardner plant, one of the Reed Gardner plants outside of Las Vegas. It's a coal plant. They're going to close them all down. Um, and, you know, in large part because, you know, utility incentives encourage overinvestment. Utilities are incented to spend as much money as possible because that's how they make money. They make money on every dollar they invest. So if <coughs> in, uh, and this is probably the case in, uh, in Texas because your distribution utilities make money the same way, if um, Encore in Texas spends one dollar in its distribution system to upgrade a substation. It rate bases it, means it puts it into a plant account and then it carries it for the entire life of that plant and it gets a return on it, plus it gets to recover the depreciation expense. So if it puts in one dollar, by the time it's done, by the, thing, by the time that's de fully depreciated, you all, if you were lived in Encore's service territory, would pay three dollars. So every dollar that goes in, you pay three dollars ultimately in rates uh, to to make that plant uh, rate go. Uh, majority power still does come from fossil fuels ultimately, and we know all the the climate uh, problems with excess carbon in the atmosphere, and people are continuing to be concerned about that. And another concern, certainly in the Southwest, especially Texas, Nevada, uh, Arizona, is the huge amounts of water that these plants use. And, and then finally. Um, you know, centralized power is prone to centralized outages, and people are starting to under, understand that uh, how um, vulnerable our system is from a standpoint of these very large high voltage substations and how many of those substations it would be necessary to take out, in essence, that you could take out large portions of the grid for long periods of time. And the way to get around that is to decentralize more, to break up the system into into smaller nodes, in essence, that can pull apart an island to some degree. I mean, you, you could take it all, down, all the way down to the microgrid, but ultimately uh, that may be too expensive and, and too difficult to do, but, but certainly to the extent that we have this, these huge, huge interconnects, the eastern interconnect and the western interconnect, and of course you all would be safe because you're in Texas, you're not interconnected uh, strongly to either one of the other parts of the United States, uh, and FERC has no jurisdiction over you except for reliability. But, uh, it, it, you know, it really is an issue that people are, are talking about. So, power capacity additions in 2015. So, these are different technologies that added new power in 2015, new major power plants. So, 41%, can anybody guess what 40% what of the additions were? were what, 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 gas? No. Wrong. Wind. 41% was wind. How about 29%? Solar. Yes, that was 29% was solar and 28% was natural gas. So in 2015, it was this ratio. I think in 2016, it was even worse than it. Solar was much more in 2016 and, uh, and much more than natural gas. And I think it may have been even ahead of wind in 2016. I'm not sure. I didn't have the 2016 numbers. But it's changing. So. This is reflecting markets. You know, this is reflecting market uh, pull because these costs are coming down so fast, ultimately. So the old U.S. power grid, here it is, you know, in large across the whole United States of high voltage transmission lines. These are the lines that FERC had jurisdiction over, with the, again, the exception of Texas, but the lines that we had, we had jurisdiction over. And, you know, you can see the interconnections, and again, there are certain nodes in certain places that if you know where those nodes are and you take out those nodes, in essence take out those high voltage substations, the entire thing will go down. It's gone. In, in Texas, uh, there are three nodes, two nodes, you could take it all down. Because it can't stand up because it's so interconnected and you can't maintain frequency across the whole thing, it goes down. So. You know, we've got to start looking at alternatives 
uh, the new power grid, uh, here's the school with solar uh, on the school and you know integration of storage and integration of control systems and other technologies that potentially can provide for security. I mean, and a lot of places, especially on the East Coast, they're very big in this now because of uh, you know Hurricane Katrina took place a number of years ago, and some of the other subsequent storms there. They're trying to set up microgrid locations within cities uh, that have central areas like schools and others that can be islanded where there's you know massive outages where people can come to plug in their laptops, plug in their cell phones, you know talk to their, their friends and neighbors and, and, and still have some level of power and security uh, ongoing even though there may be massive outages within the area because of large uh, weather events. And so people are, are really very much trying to do this. So again, how do we set up a restructured system that ensures these things can make economic sense and the services that they can provide can be provided back to the grid. So talking about these consumer devices as grid assets, this is sort of my, my, my favorite topic. Um, you know, here's a, a solar system and a Tesla power wall uh, on the wall. Um, we're seeing people put in uh, Nest thermostats, which now have capabilities. Those thermostats actually have capabilities to signal to the grid operator to be able to let them know when changes are made in the uh, level of output by that thermostat and so that that grid operator potentially can use that as an asset in ways that can reduce the overall cost of the grid and provide resources back to those people who are you know willing to allow the thermostats to do that similarly with uh, uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles or and or plug-in electric vehicles Roger and I you know done a lot in this area and Roger was re really the pioneer uh, on, on plug-ins and, and vehicles and using those vehicles for the grid. Uh, he and I were talking about this uh, coming over here. Uh, it's a complex thing to do, whether it actually can be accomplished to use a vehicle not only for transportation, but use, use it for grid services. It, it's technically feasible. In fact, I demonstrated at FERC in 2007 where we had an electric vehicle come into our driveway at FERC that was prepared at the University of Delaware by a uh, professor there, Will at Kempton, and we showed that that vehicle could actually signal the PGM grid while it was being charged and provide regulation service, which is ma making the grid stable uh, while it was sitting there being charged. So it, it can be done. There's no question about it. It's just a matter of whether or not having you know millions of nodes doing that from a data standpoint really is cost effective, and you can you can do it. And then we're seeing whole communities put in solar in many, many places. And I think you're going to see this more with something like the Tesla uh, solar roof, which is a roof integrated system. It's actually shingles that are the uh, PV system themselves within the shingle. And uh, you just put it on the roof and basically you've got this you know, tempered glass roof that's as tough as, as any shingle roof uh, in a 50 year roof. And I think most new homes, you're going to see that once we start rolling out this product over the next year, you're going to see that happen in many new homes around the country. When that, once that happens, then you couple that with a smart inverter, you couple that with a storage system, you have an entire system within that home and that group of homes that has the ability to potentially provide services out to the larger grid, services that should be compensated, services that should be valued and compensated fairly. And so the question is, how do we do that from a policy and a structure standpoint? I think we can do it from a technological standpoint, but, the, but it's a matter of policy and structure. And there's no state, including Texas, that properly values and compensates these assets yet. Uh, but we're working on it. We're, we're really working on it. And so the battle of the energy titans. So when I talk about all this stuff happening, you know, we've got this war going on. You know, um, some of you may have seen that cover. Um, you know, uh, between the big utilities and the entrepreneurs and the war is really trying to settle you know how again all the stuff behind the meter that consumers are now acquiring and utilizing can in fact be valued can in fact be recognized as having value and give it the full value to consumers that they deserve without having the utilities financial bottom lines be hurt and the reason their bottom lines is, is being hurt is because, as I mentioned, 
you know, for every dollar that the utility puts in, it gets three dollars over the life of that asset. Well, if we start putting stuff on the consumer side of the meter, the utility doesn't own it anymore. So the utility doesn't get paid their three dollars anymore. So then what happens? You know, how does, how does the utility get paid? Well, they get paid for what they've got in already. Is that enough? Well, some say no, and we want to continue to grow. And we say, well, gee, but shouldn't we do the cheapest things first? And if it's cheaper to put my stuff behind the meter and do the same thing you can do on the other side of the meter for half the cost, shouldn't I be allowed to do it and get paid something for that? You know, and that's the fight. That's the, that's the, that's the battle. That's the wrestle. It's not just about solar. It's not just about the future of solar power. That's really not what the battle's over. The battle is over this issue of consumer-facing resources versus utility-facing resources and who, you know, can do the job, i.e. deliver reliable, low-cost power at the cheapest cost overall. Yes? Nevada. Uh, yes, they did. It was it was Buffett's company that ultimately. The question was, did Buffett's company play a role in Nevada? For those of you who don't know what happened in Nevada, the Nevada Commission in December 2015 uh, reversed a long-standing net metering policy there and basically decimated it with uh, uh, lowering the payments to solar customers to to a very low level to make it uneconomical to sell solar anymore in Nevada. Uh, and, uh, and did other things that, in rate structure, uh, caused Solar City to move out of, of, of doing business there. And in fact, it went from uh, like 1,700 new applications for solar a month to 17. It was, it was literally, I mean, it went it went that fast uh, when when the rates were changed. It was it was NV Energy, which is a subsidiary of uh, of um, Buffett's uh, energy company. Um, and, we've and we've turned that around. We went back into the state. We went to the Public Utilities Commission. We uh, submitted information much like uh, uh, Austin Energy did with respect to what the, what the value, the benefits and costs of, of distributed solar are. And because of that, they've now, in an order that they just issued this December, December 2016, have reinstated it for Northern Nevada because the case was only for the Northern Nevada utility. And we're hoping and expecting to do the same thing in Southern Nevada uh, come June of this year when they, they'll file the case for Southern Nevada. So we've got a new commission that's willing to look at the evidence and look at what the real true benefits and costs of, uh, of solar are, uh, and hopefully s storage as well. So when we look at electric markets, so again, you've got a, a market in ERCOT. This was, the, this was the proposal, actually, of one of your former chairman of your public utilities commissions here in um, your Public Utility Commission here in Texas, Pat Wood, who was then, then became the FERC chair. He was a predecessor of mine, two, two chair back prior to me. Um, and he made this proposal called SMD, Standard Market Design, throughout the entire United States to put wholesale markets across the entire uh, country. And this is what, how he, he divided it up. Uh, and that was a proposal he made. Uh, the proposal, unfortunately, never got put in place. Uh, this happened instead. So the market stayed in places where there were markets, expanded a little bit, but these wide swaths of the country, the parts of the west and big parts of the southeast, decided they did not want to go into a wholesale market, that the utilities there wanted to keep control of their transmission systems. And so, and to, and to explain quickly, um, what these markets mean is if you have a transmission system there, your investor-owned utility that owns a transmission system, to be in that market, to be able to play in that market, you have to give up the control of your transmission system to an independent operator. And you have to let them operate that system, have to operate the market, and also have to allow them to plan on your transmission system, make planning recommendations to FERC, and you can, as an uh, owner of that system, make recommendations to the, to the planners who are the independent planners in that area, but you don't have the final say anymore. You give up, up that control. And so that control, unfortunately, uh, did not uh, happen uh, nationwide, and if it had, we would save billions of dollars more than we're saving now. But even though Pat was not successful, and I have to give him great credit for trying this, I like Pat, he's a great guy, um, these markets are starting to spread. They're starting to spread in the West. More markets are expanding. They've got a, uh, a sort of a RTO, Regional Transmission Organization, Independent System Operator Light there called Energy Imbalance that Arizona and Nevada and other uh, states are involved in. And in the Southeast here, uh, a company called Entergy was forced by their commissions 
to join the, uh, the up here, the, the uh, mid, mid, mid continental ISO, because all those commissions met with me in Charleston, South Carolina, complaining about Entergy's not allowing competition of wholesale generators in their market. And basically, we did a study to show how much could be saved. Over $700 million could be saved by them joining uh, an independent market. And all the commissions voted to have them join. Yes? Is there a consensus among DER developers like SolarCity on the uh, California ISO's plan to integrate the Western energy imbalance market? I don't believe there's a consensus. I think it's a good thing. Uh, I mean, and the California ISO doesn't have a plan per se. They would like to see that consolidation, but again, it's got to be voluntary by all of the uh, system operators that are outside of California that are, in essence, operators owned by independent investor-owned utilities. Um, I think it would be a good thing because it would give us access in those other, other areas to a wholesale market because FERC has just authorized the California ISO to integrate DERs into their market. And so if it's integrated into the California market and California expands, then it'll be integrated across the whole footprint. So I think it would be good for DERs. I don't know if there's a, a consensus among the DER providers. So. Retail competition in Texas, you have uh, competition, as you know, in a number of areas, uh, a number of, 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 uh, uh, of, of large distribution providers, Encore, uh, AEP, um, and the CenterPoint are the main distribution utilities, but within those distribution systems, you have, as I say, you know, dozens of retail providers who can provide you, you know, all kinds of offers, you know, 8.1 cents uh, residential for 12 months, I fought, found this someplace on the grid, which is actually very cheap in relationship to what I thought was a, actually a fascinating slide. I'd never seen this one before, Roger, but this is the average residential electric prices in Texas, inside and outside of Texas, with retail electric deregulation. Fascinating. Shows you from 2002, if you can see this, to 2013. I'd really like to see the 14, and, the 14 15, and 16 data here. But what it shows you is three things, three bars. The first bar is the Texas providers exempt from uh, electric deregulation. That's like Austin. And you can see how low their rates were. The second bar is the United States. That's the average electric price in the United States in the deregulated areas, which would be Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland, uh, um, uh, D.C., uh, New York, parts of New England. Uh, a number of states allow for, re uh, for residential com or competition in residential and commercial areas. And then the final one is electric or excuse me, as Texas providers operating under electric deregulation is the purple bar. So as you can see, when they put it in place early, the prices went sky high for some reason. I don't know why. You probably know why, Roger. But ultimately, the prices have come down to the pl place where now, at least in 2013, it would be interesting looking forward, your, your average residential price in those de deregulated, in those um, areas of, of deregulation, and I like to say restructuring instead of deregulation, is less than the United States average price, which is quite interesting. Although it's still not lower than the the uh, the munis and the co-ops, they're still still uh, doing it at a lower price. But it really shows you the power of markets and how those markets have finally worked over time for Texas. I mean, worked in a very very positive way, I think, uh, over time. So let's let's look at the wholesale area for a second on settlement prices in Texas. And um, here is, um, and I forget which day this is, but this is one shot one day on a 15-minute on a basis uh, where they settle prices in the wholesale markets in ERCOT that you can see have about um, a uh, cent and a half uh, spread or so. It's not a very big spread. It's from $17 a megawatt hour to $23 a megawatt hour. I was, I was amazed by how small the spread was here at, at this particular day, but it depends upon the time of day because it can actually get much more extreme. If you look at other hours and other days, um, it can get a lot more extreme. Now, here's one where the prices overall are high. They're like at $124 or 12 cents a kilowatt hour in most of the area, but this little very tip here there's places that are as high as three dollars, so you can see, you know, b depending upon congestion, depending upon how you can relieve that congestion, you can see 
uh, wide price variance. And here's another example of some uh, congestion issues. And simply what this means is you've got a lot of overgeneration in the middle area here where it's very blue, and you've got a lot of people outside of that that for some reason can't access the generation, so you see these price spreads. Here, this spread isn't so much either, but it's from a negative $22, and prices are negative because in essence they can't, they're asking people to give them money for the electricity because they can't sell it. And, and, and somebody who'd do that would be primarily somebody who has a wind resource because they have a, a production tax credit and they can still make money at, at a negative price. They would be doing that to a high of $17 um, a megawatt hour uh, in, in the redder areas overall in this map. So let's look. So that's the wholesale market. So here's, here's what I want to finish up with, my sort of last or next to the last slide, and then I think we could still have some time for some questions, is distribution resource planning, uh, DRP, uh, the potential for distribu distributed marginal costs. They're doing this now in California. They're, the California Commission is requiring the distribution utilities to do planning down to the circuit level. That means down to your house level. So like each one of these little dots here on this, this circuit uh, d depiction, you know, like that's somebody's house. That's somebody's commercial uh, facility, ultimately. So what you're seeing here, you know, down to these little individual circuit levels are marginal prices calculated um, uh, distributed marginal prices uh, down to that level. This is 4 to 5 p.m. I don't know what particular day this was, but you can see the prices went anywhere from like uh, 9 or $10 a megawatt hour, which that, that's like a penny a kilowatt hour, up to uh, $120, $135 uh, a megawatt hour or 13 cents a kilowatt hour between different areas. So ultimately what that means is if you had somebody who had a resource over here, and they could get it over here, you know, they should be able to make like 12 cents uh, in doing that. But it's a, matter, it's a matter of, you know, how do you make this happen? And this is, you know, the big challenge of, of the data and uh, the technology. There is technology issues here, but there are also, there, and I admit there's big technology issues to make this happen, but there are also big uh, um, regulatory issues and policy issues to make this happen. Uh, you know, a utility's not going to want to make that happen. What the utilities want to want to do is figure out why this is like this and how I can upgrade this this, this side of over here. Some substation needs to be upgraded. I can put more money in over here, and if I can do that, then this price will equalize out to these prices. They'll all equalize out. That's ultimately what's what's happening. There's congestion somehow where uh, where energy is not moving e easily between the two areas, and so the utility will and invest money on their side of the meter, I'm suggesting consumers can invest on their side instead and, and, and equalize this out as well and make money for themselves, but the utilities are resisting that. This is the big challenge. This is our challenge for the next 10 years to figure out how to solve this in ways that consumers can start realizing the value of the Nest thermostats they put in and the Tesla power walls and the PVs on the roof and whatever else they're going to put in. Those things are only getting, you know, some fraction of the real value that they have because they have value out to the system that's not being realized. So let me leave you, leave you with this, leave you with uh, Mr. Edison, which I think is an interesting quote. Uh, you know, he said, if I'd, I put my money on the sun and solar energy, what a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. I wish I had more time left. I f kind of feel the same. I don't think it's sun and solar energy that are uh, the thing I'd put my money on. I put my money on technology and data um, ultimately and policy change and I hope we can do that in the next 10 years and I hope I've got more years left as well uh, to make that happen. But with that I will uh, close and see if you all have any questions that I can answer or go into any more depth here because I know this was a pretty superficial uh, top level Discussion. Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, I recently saw that uh, NARUC came out with a guidance manual. Rate design manual, yes. Uh, yeah, for a DER, and yes. I haven't looked at it yet. But do you have, have you looked at it? Do you have any comments? Yes, on we've looked at it. Um, we commented uh, to the NARUC uh, people, staff people who wrote that. We actually, <laughs> I, think, I think the manual, Manual was like 48 pages. I think we submitted 80 pages of comments. But uh, <laughs> give you an idea that we had lots of comments. 
uh, on the manual overall. Um, I would have liked to have seen them treat more these issues of uh, distributed energy resource costs and how those costs can better be uh, valued and compensated in that manual than to talk about things like cost shifts that I personally don't think exist if you look at these things carefully and talk about things that uh, the utility industry I think uses in part as red, red herrings to distract from what the real values of distributed resources are. So, you know, I think in the end, uh, they took a lot of our comments and I think they did a fair job uh, overall, but I don't think it's um, an in-depth guide for a commissioner, a new commissioner, or a commissioner seeking to really figure out how to do DER. I think those guides are really in orders in places like California that have, that have really delved into it, in places like um, New York that are trying to do more, although I think California's done, done more than New York, to tell you the truth, and I know the, Cal the New York people very well. But, but ultimately, I think uh, commissions would do better to look at other peers that are leaders in these areas to see what they're doing in DER. Yes, sir. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question about uh, con contrasting solar and coal, and in particular, a project, I think it's called Kemper, they're doing coal sequestration and it's still not finished and they've spent yeah. like s close to seven billion dollars yes and then i saw in the article that there was the largest solar installation in the world is solar star is that right uh -huh. and it's about uh cost about two billion dollars and for that two billion you got about 569 megawatts which is about the same of what this coal plant would produce right. in energy so you, right. for what they're spending on this coal and sequestration you could have three of those solar plants that would right. generate three times as much right. power. Right. Well, and, and there was just a, and that camper plant isn't finished yet, and they have, and, and I just saw today that there was a class action f suit filed against the owners of the plant, by, I think by the ratepayers of the area that were concerned about those overruns. But yeah, I mean, the Lazard numbers, you, you can't question the Lazard numbers. They're, they're correct. It shows that uh, solar and wind are uh, except for energy efficiency, which is even cheaper, are the cheapest cheapest things to do right now. So, yes, sir. Oh, right, sorry. Right, right, we yeah. got the mic. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned some of the security benefits of transferring to a new, less centralized grid. Yes. Uh, with with regard to weather threats, do you, does that security benefit hold with regards to cybersecurity threats? <sighs> Not necessarily, although. Interestingly enough, uh, and I can do a, lo a long discussion on this, uh, I think the threats to our grid from cybersecurity are less severe than they are from physical security. Because cybersecurity, um, you can't, from a cybersecurity perspective, get into, in an effective way, these high voltage substations and destroy them uh, as you can physically. Um, and so what you can do is you can get into a particular generator or a particular control station. You can bring it down, but it's going to come down for, you know, a day or a week at the most. And then you're going to bring it back up and you're going to reboot it, et cetera. Uh, you take down, you know, two nodes in Texas and you take them down hard, uh, you're down for months. You know, <laughs> you're down for a whole long time. Um, there are issues, though, with... Um, not only decentralization, but increasing uh, smart grid um, interconnectivity and in nodes, because each one of those nodes does open up the grid overall. Uh, but uh, it's not clear to me uh, if it cascades, and it cascades effectively in a cyber attack um, in a way that can't be recovered fairly quickly with our current technology. There's been a lot talked about cybersecurity. I t in fact, I talked to a, the House Energy Committee today. Their staff was all calling me on cybersecurity this morning because they're having a hearing next week. They wanted me to testify. I said, I'm sorry, I'm really busy. I'd love to testify, but I really can't, can't do that. But, but I, I, I'm really not as worried about cybersecurity as a lot of people, I think, are. Yes? Uh, th this is all really exciting, and it, it definitely looks like this is a, the direction that we're heading in in the U.S. And my, my question is, um, you know, we're obviously held back, I think one of the themes of, of your discussion is that we're held back a little bit, just the legacy of the system we've created yes. over the last hundred years. Yes. Uh, 
for developing countries, will they be able to skip some of this and go directly to what you're describing? Oh, yeah, I think they'll be able to leapfrog it, just like, you know, in Africa, they're leapfrogging, leapfrogging the communication system with cell phones. I mean, there's, you know, more people who have cell phones in Africa than, than probably uh, uh, the U.S. Um, and um, the same thing is going to happen with, with distributed systems, I think, as well, distributed energy uh, delivery systems that you'll see developing countries that continually have outages and, and have many areas of the country that in fact have no uh, energy delivery at all will have energy delivery through cheaper and cheaper uh, energy systems. I think Roger's got to talk, uh, talk about, about how solar is going to be too cheap to meter. Uh, I, I, so I'm not going to do his talk for him, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, we all talked about nuclear power being too cheap to meter. We were really wrong on that one. But I think, I think we might be right on the fact that solar is going to be, well, especially like roof integrated panels. I mean, it's just going to make sense that people just put it on the roof, you know, and you need a new roof or you got a new house or wh whatever, a new building, you know, it's going to be in integrated into the buildings and the building will be producing more energy than you need. I mean, it's just going to happen. So, and, and it'll be part of the, the building materials that you incorporated in the structure. So. To leapfrog on that, um, so what does the U.S. in 2040 look like? Is it still is it more distributed is it still centralized is it some mix 2040 let's see so we're almost to 2020 mm -hmm. three ways three years from 20 so 23 years well i th i think it's a mix it's a big mix but i think it's starting to really by t by 2040 i think it's really starting to move over uh, largely to distributed systems just like the one chart i showed you about you know in 2015 we got more wind and solar being put in on central stations than we have um uh, gas. I think in uh, 2040 you're going to see more distributed uh, resources and more um, end users taking energy from distributed resources than from central resources, and that's around the world. I mean, that's worldwide in India and Africa uh, and, and in China and other places. I mean, China's got to do something. I mean, China's in a horrible situation with if you've ever been to Beijing and tried to breathe the air. I mean, they've got horrible, horrible, horrible problems, and the people in China are really fit up with it because it's, you know, I had a whole delegation come over here from China to visit me at FERC of um, um, regulators and other folks, uh, Chinese regulators and stuff, and they went all the way from San Francisco to Chicago to Washington, D.C., and we sat down and had lunch in D.C. I said, so you've been here for, you know, two weeks. W what do you like most about, about the U.S.? And they said, the clean air. That was, that was their first thing. They, well, the clean air is really nice. Yes. Right. Um, so, uh, I, to my understanding, one of the biggest problems with uh, local, like rooftop solar energy, energy generation, is that we don't have good enough battery technology to store that energy to use it like 20, 24 hours. Um, so, do you use see that? I'm sorry. Um, like basically, you can produce a lot of energy during the day, but you need to store that if you want to also use it during the night. Right. Um, and we don't have good enough batteries to store all, all the energy we need to like get through the night. So, like, do you see that as a big problem? Yeah, well, ultimately, you've got, um, you know, the cost of solar photovoltaic panels uh, on a cost per watt basis has come down from like $10 per watt, you know, n now to where like it's less than um, 50 cents a watt. It's like you can buy panels for like, you know, from China or whatever for like 40 something cents a watt. So $10 to 40 cents over a period of, you know, um, 10 or 15 years, you're going to see storage come down on the same curve. Uh, uh, Tesla came out with this power wall about a year and a half, two years ago. Well, just a month before last, they came out with the new, new, the new version. It's twice the density at half the cost. So you're going to see that continue on. And so storage will get there. I agree that storage is a little expensive now, but, but you know, ask me in a year, ask me in two years, and you'll see that and it's all there. It's going to be there. There's no question it's going to be there. Uh, thank you again for being here. Great presentation. Um, since you're part now of the Tesla family, yes. <laughs> is there any rule of thumb that you've heard as far as, not a Moore's Law rate, of course, of 2x per 18 months, right. but in terms of the storage costs, how much improvement can be expected on average 
yes. per year. Is it five or eight percent, or what do you use as a general rule? They thought? told me, but I'd have to kill you if I told you. <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't. I really don't know. I'm really, and really, I'd really. We just started to integrate into Tesla. I'm starting. I'm starting to learn a lot about batteries. I mean, I knew some from some of my uh, clients I had before I joined Solar City, but no, I don't have an idea of what what the what the rate of decline is. I can just, you know, that anecdotal story that I just gave you is the only data point that I have. But you know, I I, I don't see why it couldn't be at a very rapid pace that we see decline in costs and an improvement in. in in, in density overall, so, yes? Yeah, my question is, um, so the market trends are all positive and uh, a lot of the vision that you've outlined, we seem to be on a path to, to head, heading towards. My question is regarding uh, the federal regulatory resiliency to executive action. And so, to, two things from today that ex <laughs> illustrate the extremes right. is uh, some Wyoming legislators proposed taxing all renewable energy generation right. at ten dollars a ton right as a as a nope. legislative proposal nope. and I, i'm sure that they feel emboldened right now and then the other extreme was from your uh, employer elon musk uh complimenting rex tillerson's uh, uh willingness to entertain carbon pricing and actually incorporating right. uh, a price into that negative internalize that negative right. externality right. so those kind of represent extremes those and extremes. uncertainty so how resilient is the regulatory system to s extremes? Well, it, it's fairly resilient because, you know, you've got a lot of bureaucrats in, in that system that, that don't move real quickly. Um, but uh, on the one hand, on the one hand, on the other hand, if you have people who can lead organizations like FERC or others, uh, they can get a lot done and get a lot done fairly, fairly quickly. So, I mean, we'll have to see with the Trump administration and, and whether or not uh, they can, they can uh, move forward on some of these things. And... Uh, Hopefully Tillerson and uh, Governor Perry uh, will uh, see that it makes sense to add in these externalities uh, and these prices into things. I, th I think it's, it's the right thing to do. On the Wyoming legislation, I mean, you know, if the legislature in Wyoming wants to uh, consciously raise prices for all of their consumers by ensuring that higher cost uh, fossil fuel energy uh, is the only thing that they can you know, use in their state, then that's, you know, that, that's a legislative decision and, and they'll have to face the legislative consequences of their, their constituencies. Uh, we'll see how that comes out. But yeah, I, I, I don't quite understand, you know, what, what they're doing in, in Wyoming, but I'm, I, I don't, maybe they have some data points that I don't have. So, yes. At the data point, it's a lot of coal. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think you just implied also that you need, uh, at the beginning of your presentation, the uh, how do you know there's too many regulators? Maybe, right. I don't know. How, that, yeah, that engineers, right. lawyers, you, maybe yeah. need I regulators, like lawyers, lawyers yeah. redundant. I don't know. But. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I guess uh, you, you asked, got the question about 2040, what you thought it would be like, so you kind of employed implied sort of uh, whatever, steady, gradual, whatever, some steady change yeah. to more I distributed. I think it'll be a, a, a yeah. cliff that will R drop resort. all of a sudden all, all be be, you know, have, have solar on a roof, but yeah. Right, which sort of implies we're not going to buy out uh, investor-owned utilities so that they are willing to give up their assets or something. So given the changes to whatever it comes, distributed solar, other resources, batteries, et cetera, you think the uh, normal consumer is actually going to pay less or more or the same amount on their bill every month? Are we just going to yeah. pay $100? Yeah. And it's just going to look different, and it's going to be $100 every month to somebody? For the capital or somebody yeah, no, for the fuel? I, I, yeah, for the same level of services. Uh, you know, I think that's a very interesting question because interestingly enough, and I keep, you know, I, I keep that sort of advising my company on this. Interestingly enough, over the last year or so, um, the, the overall rates have been fairly flat. Um, so consumers have not been paying much more. In fact, over the last couple of years in some jurisdictions, they've actually gone down because the gas prices have gone down, although the gas prices they say are going back up, natural gas prices I'm talking about, which is one, one of the, a large part of the electric fleet is natural gas. So um, I think I think I think that that overall uh, costs will stay fairly stable over a period of time, over the over over a longer period of time, uh, for a number of reasons. Because one is because the cost of wind and solar is going to continue to go down, and so they're setting the marginal price, right? And so by those setting the marginal price, that keeps all the prices lower. Now, what 
may go up. And what a lot of utilities are trying to do, a lot of utilities are trying to jam in more fixed costs into your bill uh, so that you can't avoid them. So they're not, you know, avoid, avoidable by putting on solar or using less energy or doing, you know, putting in efficient uh, uh, LEDs or whatever. So that's going to be a point of contention. And how much fixed costs they're legitimately able to um, impose and charge people for is going to be a big battle for, for quite a while. And that may have an effect on whether you pay less or more. So. Yes? So o over the first couple of days of the, the new administration, just judging by um, its interactions with the, the EPA and the USDA in particular, um, there have been kind of a uh, number of critics ringing alarm bells a little bit over the um, accessibility and eventually maybe the reliability of government data. Um, yes. I'm curious whether in, in your judgment from having worked in the regulatory sphere and now being in the private sector, do you think that could have any potentially uh, chilling spillover effects onto uh, the investment landscape or at this point does the private sector have enough of its own information to not have to rely on the federal government's data? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure how much the, the investments uh, sector does rely on government data. I mean, they do have to rely on utility data and there's actually other sources of data um, that third parties are able to provide. Like there's a, uh, an interesting company, uh, I think it's called Genscape, but I'm not sure that's the name, that actually, uh, you know, um, charges or, uh, or uh, pays farmers to be able to put a device in a line uh, or a device on the ground underneath power lines that are coming out of power plants where you're outside of the plant on somebody else's land and you can put this device up to the line and you can tell how much power is flowing through, the, through that line so you know whether that plant shut down or not. And so there's all kinds of ways to get data. People are very creative in getting data. So I'm not sure that it's going gonna, it's gonna, to um, affect investment decisions. I don't think uh, government data has a huge impact on that. I, I mean, I may be wrong, but from what I know, at least for uh, investment development decisions in the electric energy sector, I'm not aware that government data is one, one essential data point that people have to have. One, um, as I last question. As I understand it, uh, net metering has been very important to jumpstart uh, the residential solar industry. Can you talk about is, is net metering in the future going to be as needed uh, to for the for the industry to grow right net, net metering for those of you who may not know is the concept where you get to net against your bill um, every kilowatt hour that you produce from the solar system so at the retail rate you get to offset it one for one and that was a convention that was used for many years and still is used in many states actually the majority of states right now to allow people to put solar on the roof and to get compensated it, we're starting to move away from that, and I think we will, to more value-based, to more um, uh, costs and benefits analysis. How much does it cost the utility company to have, have and service that solar system uh, in, on the grid if, any, if there are any costs? And what are the benefits from that solar system to the local grid, to the uh, larger transmission system, and to deferred all generation? Uh, uh, out there uh, as well, as well as uh, the value of uh, energy and capacity. And adding up all those, those, those slices give you then a new sort of net metering amount that consumers will in fact be entitled to, and that's what we did in Nevada. That's how we turned it around in Nevada. We did an analysis like that. We brought in an engineer, a distribution engineer, who can make that analysis, who formerly worked for PG&E, and he did it. And we brought in a, a cost of service person who could look at the utilities cost of service and marry the two together. And we now have something that's defensible as opposed to, well, let's just do this kind of rough cut. It's equal to, to retail. So, and that's, you know, that's what Austin did a long time ago. And that's, I think, what more and more people are going to start moving towards. So, I have a question. It's going to be the last one, if you don't mind. Huh? Uh, first of all, it's interesting to see someone working for Tesla taking inspiration from a quote from Edison because Tesla is trying to disrupt whatever Edison has <laughs> well, given to us. Yeah, so true. that said, so you have uh, big players like Google and Apple like entering the smart homes, the smart, all, all this technology. Yes. Do you s see a uh, space or growth for small, small players in, in this? And if, if yes, in what way? Because you know, people are used to buying Apple expensive products, yes. so they might buy Apple and Tesla power walls, yes. but if someone working at his garage is coming with a, yes. you know, he cannot... No, I think it. there's absolutely lots of space for small entrepreneurs to come up with new innovations uh, in, ho in homes and in businesses to help those people better 
uh, take energy services and there's room for them to just get big enough so you get bought up by Google or Apple. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. We really appreciate your time coming to Austin, and uh, thank all of you for attending. We'll see you next week. Thanks for the presentation. Oh, good. I'm glad you all liked it.